it's a nice honor to have the film that won the Oscar two weeks ago playing for you guys tonight. And what we have tonight for you also then is a little bit about the magic. When you watch a movie, even for those of you who are directors, producers, cinematographers, editors, the thing oftentimes you don't want your audience to think about is all the work you did. You do the job right, maybe they won't notice. You do the job wrong, they notice. And editing, maybe more so than any of the arts, is known as the invisible art form. And I think when you have a movie like Birdman, with its seemingly never-ending takes, with its cuts that are all hidden, you realize there are magicians just hiding right off behind the curtains, sort of like the Wizard of Oz, pulling all the strings. And it's such a fascinating construct when you watch this movie, because you're not watching it looking for cuts. You're just watching the film. You're not thinking about all the different takes, all the choices they made, all the technology. You're just involved in the story and the characters. And if you doubt that, well, let's look at all the Oscars at one. I think that's sort of its proof. Um, our speaker tonight, editor Douglas Christ, has had this remarkable career. He's worked with Steven Soderbergh on a number of projects. He was an apprentice under Steven Mirione, the Oscar-winning editor. Um, he also worked with George Clooney on films. And then one of his first films was Babel, also known as the movie that was nominated for a whole bunch of Oscars, including Best Editing. And since then, his track record has continued. In one year, he worked with Harmony Korine on Spring Breakers, and in the same year, he worked on the wonderful drama Arbitrage, which gave us maybe Richard Gere's best performance ever. And then, of course, as an editor with Stephen Marioni, he edited Birdman. That's what I'm talking about. You're Birdman. Let's go back one more time and show them what we're capable of. Birdman, the movie that went in, took all the Oscars home, and uh, flew off with them. It's a real remarkable achievement and a real remarkable honor to have him here tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, moderated by myself and Toba Leiter, uh, Douglas Christ. I actually was looking for the cuts this time, and all I saw is maybe a couple dissolves, you know? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so what did you guys do in the editing room? Just like shoot darts and <laughs> yeah. play yeah. video games? I, I wish, beer, I, wish I had it that easy. It was, uh, as Eric said, I, uh, worked, I worked under Stephen Mariani for like 10 years, and then after, after Babel I went out on my own, and then... But then he called me about this movie because he, he, you know, he's extremely talented and very busy. And he had two movies he was doing simultaneously. He was on Osage County and uh, George Clooney's movie, Monuments Men. So he was on both those films. So he couldn't really do this one full time. So he, uh, he was still involved. And him and Alejandro, I think, worked out some things ahead of time. And rehearsals were shot. And they shot tons of rehearsals. And um, and so I came on during main production, and unlike what I usually do on a movie where I sit back in my room and I let the footage come in and I see the director maybe, you know, because nobody screams dailies anymore. Um, <laughs> I see don't. the director, yeah, they just don't. There's no, like, daily screenings where you sit down with the whole crew. That just doesn't happen anymore. Everybody gets their DVDs or they get their quick times and I look at it on the iPad. That's, nobody wants to bother. But unlike... That so I don't see the director that often, but Alejandro wanted me at set every day, so I would uh, go every day and uh, we'd talk about the stuff they shot, and he'd talk about what his favorite takes were, and we'd talk about, hey, can we, uh, you know, we 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 had they had the planned edit points, but you know, just like everything, you know, Alejandro is such a perfectionist. He wants, he wants. He wants his cake and eat it too, of course. He wants, he had a take, you know, he has take one take that is like perfect, except for this moment, or except for this moment, except for this moment. And can we find a place to put an edit where no one will see it? And, uh, and so those were the experiments we were doing. So, um, yeah, so it was a. How can you do an edit that nobody will see? I mean. Well, that's giving away the magic, but. Um, <laughs> I'll be a little bit more open because, you know, we were, we, you know, Alejandro didn't want a lot of the magic given away, but uh, there's been several articles contradicting coming out in Hollywood Reporter 
one scissors, 15 minute take in a movie, one scissors this, one scissors that. Uh, the latest one is actually probably the most truthful uh, that uh, the visual effects company gave a lot away. Um, yeah, it's, it's, edits can be done surprisingly places you never thought of before. I mean, we had the planned ones where, you know, there'd be a dark alley or a whip pan or, right. and the pans aren't, you can do a, an edit when the pan, camera's not even panning fast because you just start wiping the frame and right. you find an edge or whatever. And, um, and that's where a lot were done. But I mean, there's, there's, there's rotos that we did and different things like that. Like one of them I'm probably the most proud of is one I came up with because as like I said, he wanted this performance and he wanted this performance and there was no, where are we going to put it? And it's the scene where Michael Keaton is on stage performing for the audience and the camera's coming around him and Ed Norton's getting drunk in the background and throws. So there's actually, we're, we, we rotoed around Michael Keaton and it's almost like a 40 second edit happening because we're changing the backgrounds to a different performance of Ed Norton. So then once the, once, Michael finishes, he steps out of frame, and we've wiped completely across. So there's there's an edit there that wasn't planned. And I mean, so in essence, the foreground was not edited, but the background was? It was, what it was, it's basically a split screen, is the easiest way to okay. describe it. Because it starts on Michael, the cameras, and then they, they at some point they dissolved in a, the, the little corner that never cut. But then they, you know, as, the, as, as he's talking, I did it in the Av at first, where I just did an animate around him. And, uh, and we figured out we could do it. You know, it was just like this, because we thought, oh, we could do the cut later when there's a whip pan, but that wasn't going to work because then we wouldn't get the moment we wanted with Ed. And, um, and there's a, you know, there's so many things you can do with the visual effects once you've figured out it's possible. But uh, I mean, there's, there's ones we all came up with when Michael Keaton shoots himself and he falls out of frame, we switch the audience because the gun goes off, his arm wipes the frame, and he falls, because Michael Keaton's best performance was his last one, but the audience had been there all night, they're tired, they're not professionals, their, their best performance was take four, not, not you know, and that's wow. the best audience he wanted. So, so when he falls out of frame, there's a cut there. So it's, you know, there's, there's 100 cuts in the film. No, so, one when she... she uh... Uh, Sam yes. comes out of the of the terrace, and she goes, and you see out of frame, and then she see her in the corridor, and I felt that it was like kind of a dissolve that it wasn't a, the What's camera re really didn't follow her. Don't tell oh, me that oh. it was like one cut, because now you are humiliating me in front oh. of the student. <laughs> oh, you mean when they go down the dark steps? Yeah, there's a cut there. <laughs> All right. <sighs> <laughs> and and, and if, if anything, it, it, I think that's the fun. And when you do watch the movie like a second time, it is right. It's like, can I see these cuts now? And I bet it's still incredibly hard yes. to find. Like you say, yes. it's a hundred cuts. Yeah, I would have guessed the number was half that. You, everybody would. Yeah, I, the number I keep saying was like forty, and you know, there's 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 more than that. So, I mean, there were like I said, they had the planned spots, and then we we came up with other ones on our own. Mm -hmm. and, and we did a lot of other stuff, like, the, to the excess, you know, on every film you do speed ramps and you do dialogue replacement in people's mouths, you do all kind of stuff. But here you had to really work it because you couldn't play anybody's over the shoulder too much. And, you know, if you wanted to, you know, you know, find, you know, somebody flubbed the line a little bit, you had to sneak the word in their mouth. Or, or we would ramp the speed up to get the pacing a little faster. Whenever, you know, I have, a, there's one scene, I won't give it away because I think I'm talking too much. You're filming this. Um, Just for us. What if $20 went in your hands? Yeah. Would you be able to tell us a little more? <laughs> about 10? Um, I'll bring it down. The, uh, but there's a scene that where I, you know, it was one of the scenes we feel where the movie slowed down a lot. And so we, I was ramping the speed up between every line of dialogue. So when somebody wasn't talking, we would ramp it 30% faster and then bring it back down and still probably run their dialogue 5% faster. So we would be running ramps up and down. I never did so many speed ramps in a movie. Mm -hmm. And we're What's doing- What's a speed ramp? It's basically adjusting the speed of the film and making it run faster or slower. And, and, and because of the Avid technology and everything, I, you yeah. can just do that. And you can adjust the audio too. You can run the audio 5% faster. So, and it, and it won't same, change the pitch or anything. So you just, 
you do that or you well, and sometimes we actually slowed down yeah. sometimes we actually wanted the moment to last a little longer yeah. i mean and what was i think ingenious about alejandro is he knew to build in some of these moments in the film where okay we're going to take a break here where you know it's like one of the my favorite scenes which i didn't understand when he shot it was oh, the, corridor, the, the corridor. The corridor and the yeah and, and 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 that of course we had the mobility of once and there's actually a cut when the camera's panning over to the empty hallway after it's actually it's actually wiping and you didn't see it <laughs> <laughs> but anyway they 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 uh they um they, you know, we, we, I think we slowed that footage down so it would even play slower because, you know, they, he knew he could go faster or slower with it until how long, until he wanted uh, Michael to step in. And, you know, and I think we're even digitally zooming in a little bit before the camera actually starts to zoom. Well, it feels so. like, it, you know, the, a movie like this needed, you know, the combined however many years of experience it's been between yourself and Stephen Mariani yeah. where it's like all these things you've learned along the way on all your projects right. and feel like you had to use every trick in the book. Yeah, that's the thing. You didn't, you, uh, you know, maybe this is true or not. I don't know. I, there is a freedom to be able to cut the coverage. I mean, there's a freedom to be able to say, okay, this isn't what I want. I can cut to the other side. I can right. cheat a line over somebody's back. I can do, and you don't, you don't have that capability, but you have times when you can do, a, um, you can do more than you thought you could. And there's some uh, edits that are, you know, that, you know, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to do in like Hitchcock's day when he made his movie that you, that you could do now. That's what I mean, I'm saying. It's like when I started editing, it's like you take two splices of film yeah. and they put a tape. Yeah, How yeah. much can you m manipulate? Yeah, you're, you it's, know? it's the ability to be able to wipe and digitally, digitally manipulate it. And there's a term that I learned that I didn't know existed called digital stitches, which is where we have two shots that there's not they don't physically go together they they match pretty close but you have to actually create a moment digitally in between that you animate it and so that that's where you, you just know. blew the mind yeah. of a gentleman in the fourth the last row <laughs> so the obvious one of that the one the one there were some of those actually planned to be done be and a couple we had to do because we had to fix things but there was the one that was planned was the the crane shot that goes up the side of the building and gets you know he takes off he lifts off the ground yes. and then and then he's on top of the roof so that's yeah. two different crane shots put together so you're going up and you it turns toward the building and you see the brick wall and that brick wall and there be, becomes it goes from the brick wall to the digital animation back to a new shot so it looks like you're you've never cut when you've you know. and, and I imagine, you know, Alejandro was looking, to, you know, he could have just put this thing together like Legos, but he wanted editors who really knew editing. I mean, both of you guys had worked with him before, yeah. right? You worked with him on Babel, but it's like he needed editors then who could find those moments even where it seemed like you couldn't cut. Yeah. You needed editors who were like, no, you still can cut. You can still try to do something. You can try to do anything to uh and like i said he he never wants to compromise alejandro's a very particular guy and you know very you know has his idea how to do it and he doesn't want to change if he can i mean it, you know he wanted to make a movie this time that took away because alejandro the, safety, a, the safety, safety of cutting because alejandro is a he's a genius editor himself i mean he doesn't actually physically ever touch the computer but he's, you know, he's, uh, he, he knows all the possibilities of an editing room. He knows, and that's where he even pushed me. He's like, you know, he knew I could do something with this if I tried. If there was something that we thought we couldn't, you know, I'm like, it's one shot, what am I gonna do with it? You know, no, no, there's a way to make this work. And, and uh, so he, he knows that, that about it for sure. So, and he wanted to, to take, make a film where he wasn't relying on the editing room as much. And he, he said to me when I visit one of my many visits to set, he was so stressed and he was like saying that he's like, I got to get it right. I got to get it right. I can't fix this later. I got to, I got to, it's got to be, I got to keep all those ideas in the head. You know, there's the pacing, there's everything. There's the, the, the plan of when, you know, cause literally there's not, you know, he, he would script edit on set. He would shoot the scene and then shoot it again with less dialogue and shoot it with less dialogue and shoot it again with, so he'd have, cause he knew we couldn't cut the take. 
So it would be like, you know, we got we got to have our option of what what, what we're going to do here. So that was all the if choices we made. If it was me, I would just confuse with all the corridors, yeah. okay? <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> find my way or match this corridor with this corridor. Right. So thank God it was all one big thing because yeah. imagine yeah. trying to figure out where That's you are. That's why it was so funny when the one article came out and said there was like a 15-minute take in the movie. Well, we've been very open from the beginning that half the movie was shot in Queens and half of it was shot in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and all the backstage stuff that's the dressing rooms and the hallways and corridors are all a stage. And, you know, the actual theater is its own, you know. And, and for the New York so. impaired, Queens and Manhattan, it takes more than 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Just because some of them don't know. Yeah. So, Burroughs. So you work both with uh, Soderbergh and, and Inarato. And I have to say, those two directors actually are kind of famous for movies that have so many moving parts, so many people, you right. know. A lot of um, characters. A lot of, a lot of, yes, stories that are intertwined with each other. Mm -hmm. I almost think that maybe they took you and Steve because, in Rato, because he saw what a good job you did actually on traffic and, 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 and you know, Ocean Eleven. So, so let me. Well, that's more Steve than me because, you know, I know still. Steven did, we did a movie that we worked on together called Go. Right. And it's a movie with multiple stories, multiple Absolutely. multiple time period, you know, just different. And Soderbergh knew Stephen, but not real well. And he he contacted Stephen. He says he, he thought Go was one of the best edited movies he ever saw. So that's why he got the Traffic job. And and then and of course Traffic is why you know, Ritu calls. So it's, that's what I'm uh, saying. You know, it's 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 definitely because he started even with the Morris Porus, you know, all the moving part. Mm -hmm. So, um, you work with both of them. What, uh, what is the difference? What, what, well, they're, they're two different people. Um, <laughs> totally. uh, I want to no. hear it from you. I have my no. own different theories. Accents. Well, no, they're, 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 uh, they're both very committed and uh, very good filmmakers. I mean, Inaritu is more, I would say, if I was describing, is, a little, is more, in, you, you see his passion on his sleeve more, right. and you see his emotion more. More uh, and yeah, and he, um, and you know, he, he, and until maybe Birdman, again, he went to a comedy, we can call it a comedy, he went, he went to a comedy that, because, you know, to him, a movie is where you're having a good time or a waste of time. You know, <laughs> you have to be feeling something, you have to feel anger, you have to feel, you know, despair. And, and Soderbergh is more of a cool cat. I mean, he's very quiet and doesn't really talk a lot. And and is but is very sure of himself, and um, you know, and and shoots a lot less. He will shoot. He he has a pretty good idea of what he wants, and he'll, once he gets it, he's done. I mean, there were, I, especially on the like the Ocean's Eleven movie, you know, there was days we got five hundred feet of film. He got what he wanted, and he was done. And, uh, and so, and that's not a small film. No, that's not a small movie. I mean, we had a nice big long schedule, but the only day we got. A lot of film was the day they had all 11 characters in the same room and they had to shoot coverage on all of them. That was the day we got, I don't know, 30,000 feet. Uh, I think in film back then days, because we were still getting film and winding it. And, and uh, even though we cut it on the Avid, we were still, uh, we were still sinking dailies on film. But, uh, yeah, they, they definitely work differently, the two of them. They're both, they, uh, they're definitely, uh, I would, you know, but I, you know, both talented in their own way. No question. Yeah, well, well, I thought it was interesting. You were you were talking um, before we came out here about how, you know, Babel had so much more footage mm -hmm. than Traffic. Right. And if you guys have seen both films, I mean, Traffic is, in some ways, even more epic than Babel. But yet, you were saying Babel was the most footage. It sounds like you might have ever had to cut. Yeah, it was a lot. It was. It was. Um, I'm trying to think what the total was. It was over 200 hours. So. It was. It Apparently, was, you, you cut a documentary. You just didn't yeah. It was, it was. It was. It was quite a bit. It was. Uh, I was telling him. I, I during the Morocco part of the shoot, I was screening like four hours of dailies a day. So they were because they would shoot. They had a first and second unit going, and it started getting less as they went because Morocco was the probably the biggest and the toughest part of the shoot for him, and you know he doesn't know the language at all, and it, and and he was shooting sixteen millimeter, 
and they were show they were shooting a lot of footage because of that reason, because of the 16 millimeter. I think because they felt it was they could burn more. And then, um, then when he went to Mexico, because he knows, you know, definitely knows the language, and and they shot there, they switched to 35 millimeter on that, and uh, but still quite a bit of footage. And then Japan, they went to even less footage, because they were, they started they they switched the camera to anamorphic. We were so they shot even though the movie's 185, they use anamorphic lenses for Japan to make the look look differently. Mm -hmm. So it was it's anamorphic with the sides cut off. So, uh, so they kept switching the formats of, uh, of, of how it was. Oh, wow. So, um, and Japan was probably the shortest part of the shoot. And probably in many ways, it's, it's what's funny. It's, I think Japan was shot in three weeks and it also was, uh, probably the one part of the movie that had the less story changes to it, the less cutting down of the story. Um, I would say that probably the Mexico portion and and the Brad Pitt portion of Morocco were probably the ones that were restructured the most and and uh, redone differently from the script. But uh, Japan was worked pretty well the way it was. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, I know that I was involved in a couple of movies that had a lot of stories or characters are intertwined, and it's took almost like one third of the movie or half of the movie sometimes to finish with the setup mm -hmm. until the story started to merge and the narrative kind of came. And um, it, it was kind of dull in a way because, not dull, but it's just until the movie came together because you cut from here and you cut from here. And how do you keep the challenge is to keep the emotional connection between all this while you're setting up. Is there any tricks to make? I don't make? know. There's no tricks, I don't think. I, I know they, Stephen, because the way we did Babel, um, I, I assembled the movie while Stephen was on Good Night, Good Luck still. He was in, he was in Italy. So I, I, when they were shooting the film, I assembled it. And when him and Alejandro started working together, they did experiment with changing the script where they were, they would cut to the more the stories a little bit more often and have spend less time with them. But then they ultimately realized the script had it right. And they just had to spend time with the one group. We started out with the Morocco story. I think we spent almost 20 minutes with it before we start seeing another right. story. Right. And it is just a matter of completely settling in and getting that moment where it met that climax. I think that we don't cut out of the Morocco story till the kids actually shoot at the bus. And then I honestly don't remember where it goes after that. It's been so long since I've seen the film, but I, I do know that that I do remember that part of the structure. And um, but you know, I, as all Hondo is, you know, it, it is. And I always I still view this viewpoint when I work on any movie is to me it's it's the scene means nothing if you don't feel something from it or if you don't have an emotion that it gives you. And 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 that's what I think I try to cut for when I'm cutting something. I I want to cut what emotionally affects me and how I feel. And I told this story before, and I, um, but on Babel, I think it's the first time I ever had it happen to me. I actually started to well up in dailies. I was, I was sitting, <coughs> watching dailies myself, you know, because uh, Stephen wasn't there and Alejandro wasn't there. Stephen, Alejandro was off shooting. Stephen was in Germany, or in Italy yet. So I'm watching the scene where Brad Pitt helps Kate Blanchett to pee and it's such a s scene, and I think, and I, you know, there, there, I think there were like 12 takes of that, of the one setup, and, and I fast forward to take one thinking, I'm not gonna watch them all. And, and, and I fast forward to take one, and I start, so I just start with take two, because I don't want to clear to the last one. Because, and take two was the first one I saw, and I started, I started having tears going on my face watching that scene, because it just, to me, you know, there's nothing more more caring of a person than to help someone who's in need and to and to just be there for them and uh and when i assembled the scene and i went ahead and i watched the rest of the take i watched the, quite a few of the rest of the takes but they didn't have, maybe because take two was the first one i saw or it was the best i don't know i really feel it was the best because i none of the rest of them affected me that way 
And so when I assembled the scene, I used mostly take two. I didn't. I went to some of the other ones sometimes for certain reasons. And I know Brad Pitt's makeup started to peel off on some of the later ones because you know they had a lot of makeup caked on his eyes to make him look older. And uh, and uh, but I you know I know I, I stuck with take two, so. Before we open it to our, to our audience, I actually wanted to ask you about working with Harmony Korine. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have, how many of his films you've seen, but he yes. directed some of the craziest movies I've ever seen in my life. Right. He did a film called Gummo that I've spent however many years it's been since then trying to figure out what the heck I saw. Yeah. Um, what's it like working with a filmmaker like that who's, well, he wrote Kids, that was his initial like rise in Hollywood. Spring Break. And Spring Breakers was the film you cut. Yeah. What was it like working with a director like that? Well, I can't, I can't say enough nice things about Harmony. Um, uh, Harmony's a crazy, he's 41 and he's in junior high, I think. <laughs> um, he's, um, he's crazy and nutty, I mean, he's, but he's normal. He's very normal, he has a wife and uh, a, a little kid, a little girl. Uh, but. You know, it was it was one of the more freeing experiences of working on that movie because he he called me. I I hadn't heard. I, my agent hates me sometimes. They say to me, "Do you even work in this business?" Because they 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 you know they call up and they say Harmony Korine wants you for his film, and I go, "Who's Harmony Korine?" Or Harmony Korine is actually how they say his name. Um, we'll re-edit it. Yeah, so pronounce yeah. It I'm not even saying it right. Uh, Harmony Korine. So anyway. Uh, and I said, who's that? And they're like, you don't know who he is? And I'm like, no. And, I, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, I, got, he, I got him on the phone, and he just says to me, he says, I want you to mix this up. Because his scripts, at least back then, now his new script, which I got, because <clears throat> I think I'm doing his next movie, um, has, um, he just wrote an outline, basically. He, didn't, he doesn't write very much dialogue. And it's just basic, it was like 70 pages with like, you know, hey, they got pink fingernail polish on and they do this and they, they bust up some drugs and they, and that's basically the outline of the script. And I read the script and I said, and you know, there's like misspellings in it. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I said, this is written by a 13 year old. And I'm like, and so anyway, I, I, I uh, do the movie and anyway, he calls me and he says, I want to mix this movie up. I don't want it to be in order. And that's all he really said to me. I just don't want it to be in order. I'm just, you know, and it's and it was written in order. So I kind of, you know, he he gave me one of the greatest compliments ever. Um, we I was working, I was putting the scene together where the girls robbed the chicken shack at the beginning, and and I I got kind of inspired by the Coen Brothers. I something remi reminded me of uh, Blood Simple, where they have this shot of the road and the headlights and the stuff are going, you know. And I remembered that, and I, and I just kind of built it all out of that. I kind of thought headlights and the car, and then I thought, you know, let's hear the voices of them planning the robbery over that, them saying, let's just do this, and let's, while they're going to do it. And, and, and I just, you know, and Harmony initially talked about the Skrillex music, but then he said, hey, I want some music in this movie that is just more like conventional score. So I love Cliff Martinez, and I start throwing that in. And, and uh, anyway, I sent the movie to him. I mean, I sent the clip that I'd cut. And he told me this when we were working together. He said he was, um, he was having such a horrible shoot. The producers were driving him crazy. Everything was wrong. Everything, you know, he was just exhausted. And he gets this quick time from me. And he's like, I, I didn't want to watch it. I just couldn't watch it. I just was having a horrible time. So he, he, he couldn't watch it. So the next morning he gets up and he says, okay, I got to look at this. So he looks at what I sent him, and he said it was the first time he could relax. He's like, he says, I got it. He says, he says, he says it was like, he, he, it's like this guy gets what I want to do. And, and that was a great compliment, because when we started working together, he doesn't hover. He doesn't hover at all. He just will look at what you have, and he'll give you ideas of what he's thinking, of what he wants. And then he goes out and shoots basketball. <laughs> and then he and then and then he comes in like an hour later and and you know he'll say well I want to try maybe try putting that shot in instead of that shot, but he doesn't hover he doesn't like tell you where to cut he doesn't tell you what to do and 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 then we'll talk out ideas and he'll just say hey you know like one of the things we did on that film was I had sort of come up with the idea I think I can take credit for it I can sort of come up with the idea that the movie should end on the kiss on the ramp and it wasn't planned that way because when when 
I don't know who saw the movie in here, but when Franco gets shot, the girls are supposed to bend down and kiss him. Well, logically to me, in the real world, I'm thinking they're not going to, they just got shot at, they're not going to spend time to stop and kiss, they're going to go down and start shooting everybody up. So I thought, I'm going to cut the kiss out and save that for later, they'll come back and kiss him when they're done. But the way the movie was written also, the girls weren't calling home until the, after the shootout, after they've stolen the car, because you, you see the scene where they're in front of the thing and they're on the phone, the car that, is, that they've stolen is there. And, and um, so, but we ultimately decided, and one of the things I asked him for was, I said, I need more voiceover. This phone call is not long enough. I want a longer phone call. I want these, and I, and I, and, and, and he would, the interesting thing he would do, I'm getting off, because this is working in harmony. Um, the, 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 they would shoot, he would shoot a scene in one location, then he'd shoot the exact same scene in another location. Because he wanted to blend them or change them. So, so we decided, since we figured out the kiss was the end of the movie, that the phone call couldn't come after the kiss and, and it couldn't come after the shootout. So the phone call had to come before the shootout. So what great thing happened in the world of editing is you're able to basically be telling the end of the movie and these girls are talking about the great trip they had on spring break while they're killing everyone. Mm -hmm. So the phone calls happen simultaneously. So we start with the phone call, even though in chronological order it took place after the shootout where they, you know, but we don't have a phone call then and they drive off at the end in a much more elegant way than it would have been if the phone call had been there, so. It's the fun That's of having what, creative yeah. freedom as an editor. Yeah, and it was, you know, and it's fun to work with someone who just kind of, uh, you know, lets you do, you know, it's built, this movie was, you know, in many ways built in the editing room and just and conceived in the editing room with its style and, and uh, you know, so it was a fun movie to work on. We should open to students because they want to ask questions. They go home. All right, this is pretty technical. Okay. So, uh, when you're pre-producing Birdman and, ta and having the meetings about the editing, what's the specs of the file size and the codec and all that to make that work? Well, you're gonna not. You're gonna believe I don't really know what you're talking about. Now. <laughs> no, uh, I wasn't actually in the pre-planning, but I know they shot on Alexa. It's, you know, Rexo Raw, which I think is a little over 2K. Uncompressed? Uncompressed. And, and what's so funny is they actually were running a backup file, which is like captures like a QuickTime image, which is almost 2K. And one day we had to use it because the Raw dropped out or something. And Chivo says, I'm not going to have that in the movie. And so he says, even though it fixed and no one could tell, he uh, says, we're not shooting a backup anymore. So, um, but anyway... <laughs> The, um, but we, you know, we cut on Avid, we just do, they just have everything transcode to 36 DNX compression. Cropped? What's that? Was anything cropped from a bigger frame size? Oh, that's a good idea. You, God, you asked that. Um, they actually shot the movie with the plan because they knew we were going to have to do some tricky stuff with editing. They actually framed it with giving it 4% extra area around the outside edge of the 185 so that we would know that if we needed that area to do like a blow up or an adjustment or, you know, on, on the tweaks, it would give us that extra room to cha cha adjust the frame size. But it, you know, it was only 4%. So, um, but yeah, the movie was just shot like 185, so. But they had 15 minute takes with uncompressed. There was no 15 minute takes. Okay. That's what I was saying. <laughs> the longest, the longest take in the, the longest takes Every, the standard day of shooting was they would shoot about, it, it would be a setup of like three to four minutes long. Then, and that's how long the takes were. And there was the longest take that I think they ever shot was close to five minutes. And the, probably the longest take in the movie is five minutes. But most of, them are, the, most of them are way shorter and there's cuts in within those. Even in those four minute takes, we'd put two or three edits that we didn't plan on having. Yeah, because so, when you said uncompressed, I'm like, no way it could be more than that no, many minutes. No, no, no. There was not a 15 minute. Cameras take. explode when you try no. that. No, there, there was a weird thing. You know, it's, uh, this is the thing. You know, when you got to when they have Oscar time, the studio actually put me out a lot to do a lot of publicity and try to do things, and it became a weird thing where we were out like publicizing ourselves, but yet I wasn't allowed to talk about some of the secrets we did. And they had a reporter who was 
hounding me to give stuff up, and I've given you guys way more information. Than, I didn't give her any information. And, and, uh, and then so she doesn't have anything to write about, but then she got our DP on the phone, and she hounded him, and he finally kind of caved a little bit and just said, oh, there's 10-minute takes in the movie, there's 15-minute takes. He just told her stuff just to make her go away. <laughs> so, and then, but then there was a bit of a fallout because Alejandro was mad that the, that press was out there. And, uh, and now, since the Oscars are over with, the visual effects company has sort of blabbed and said, oh, there's this many, that's why I can say there's 100 cuts in the movie now because it's in The Hollywood Reporter. So it's, it's uh, now, but maybe I shouldn't because now I'm verifying it. <laughs> so It's all in WikiLeaks. Yeah. It's like the woman said in the movie, so yeah. now you're denying it. Yeah, yeah. Right? now, yeah, now. You got the scoop. Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, just don't put this on Twitter. I don't need it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello. How did you come to editing, and who are the editors that inspired you? And are there particular movies of their work that are particularly m meaningful to you? Hmm. Editors inspired me. That's an interesting. You know, when I first, you know, when I first I saw you in the audience, and I thought, that looks like Doug Liman. But <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, you look like Doug it's Liman. It's true. Uh, you said well, to get into places. Yeah, though. which, yeah, which, which I, Doug yeah. Liman. Which I worked for. Uh, anyway, the uh, I would say, you know, when I went to film school, I didn't know I was going to end up in editing, and I uh, I uh, initially thought I wanted to do photography or something else like that. But when I got out of here and started interning, I ended up in a cutting room, and I found out that's where I belonged, and uh, I was doing film. Um, now, your question, uh, editors that I, you know, I admire, I, I'm a... Uh, I don't know a lot about film history of great editors. I mean, uh, you could certainly say people like, um, uh, oh man, I can't even think of his name. Walter Murch. Yeah. Walter right. Murch or, or, or um, D.D. Allen. I was going to go back Snowflake. even farther. Uh, who directed Sound of Music? Uh, Weiss? Bob Weiss. Bob Weiss. He was, he directed, you know, he edited Citizen Kane. So, um, really? Pretty yeah. Good. He, st he started out as an editor. So uh, um, I would, you know, I would say Jerry Greenberg, who uh, cut French Connection. Um, you know, Michael Kahn's a great editor. I, I think Dylan Tinchner is one of the better editors around. I think I've worked with the, one of the greatest editors that exists right now, Stephen Marioni. And I think Stephen is probably the biggest influence on me uh, uh, completely because he's the one who pushed me to start cutting. And even from our very first film together, he would say, can you... Can you cut this scene for me, or can you do this scene? And um, and you know, and working on traffic, he would give me a lot of scenes to cut, and would say, "Can you cut this? Can you do? Well, you want to cut this, or you want to do this?" Or and then, and then we started working more. We worked together, like even on Twenty One Grams. He would basically say, "Can you get the last half of the movie edited?" <laughs> so, <laughs> so because he would be so in, you know, so busy polishing the part he's working on, he said, "Can you just get that together, so I can." Uh, you know, because I don't know how many editors we have in here, but I sometimes it, I sometimes struggle through an assembly because you 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 in some respects I don't want to change it after I've done it, so I struggle through the assembly to get it the way I want it to begin with, and then I, but I find recutting actually easy to some extent because it's, Rewriting, it's a, yeah, yes, it's like you know then you can play with it so. You spoke earlier about uh, some directors being over your shoulder and some not. And yeah. Which do you prefer? I, I prefer that, you know, I would almost say maybe Harmony's a little too relaxed. Because, um, uh, you know, uh, you want that director who will push you a little bit more sometimes. That, you know, um, I don't like a, a, a guy who hovers all the time. I want, you know, I would, you know, the thing, the brilliant thing about Harmony is he inspires you to do stuff without hovering. He inspires you to try things and do things and, and, but I'll work with like a, my, a guy, I love him. I mean, Nick Jarecki on Arbitrage, and he'll certainly give you your own time, but then he, then you have the hours that he's with you that you're trying this and trying this and trying this and trying this, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 uh, it's tiring because I think Nick described it to me the first time I never even realized it, how hard it is. I'm not saying my job's hard, but how hard your job is sometimes where you have to use the um, mechanical sense of the software and putting things together, but then you got to think creatively at the same time. And when you got a director feeding you creative ideas from behind, my, I, my creative end starts to shut off 
because I have to keep up with his, I have to keep up with the mechanics while he's throwing fast creative ideas at me. And directors who just do that to you, it's, it's hard to keep up and you can't give them the input back. So I think if they give you the breathing room, then you're like, they'll tell you to do something and then they leave and then you say, well, I did what you wanted, but I, now I came up with this idea that you didn't, you know, that I think works even better or this, let's try this. So I think you need a little bit of both. So, I mean, you know, so. And then finally, how long was the rehearsal period and how long was uh, the shoot? On what, Birdman? On Birdman. Uh, Birdman, they, uh, they rehearsed a long time. I was, I didn't get to need, I know they had rehearsed for almost two weeks in New York and I think they might have rehearsed for a week in LA. They had, I mean, they did, they basically rehearsed the whole movie and started to block out camera movements and they shot the rehearsals for that reason, just to kind of figure out, okay, we want to see if this is going to be the way we're going to map it. The shoot was uh, about 30 days, um, which is what, about seven weeks or something with right. weekends and stuff. Not very long. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Sure. Doug Lyman, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Um, if you don't feel comfortable answering this, don't. Okay. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually quite a good friend of the visual effects supervisor of the film. But yeah. I was wondering how closely did you actually work with visual effects? And is that a trend that's happening more now, that editors are working with visual effects more? I, uh, who's at, your is friend? Is it Adam Howard? Adam Howard? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I know Adam. Um, the, uh, I don't know if it's a trend because I don't tend to work on heavy visual effects movies. This is probably one of the more heavier visual effects <laughs> movies I've worked on. And, and, but we did, do, we did do the thing where, you know, they had the planned stitch points, as they called them. But then Howard or Adam or, um, sorry, Adam, or whoever, when we were, because they had somebody else first, they had Jake, but when we would try to come up with an edit that wasn't planned, I would usually grab them and say, hey, can this be done? Can you fix this in the visual effects? Can this be done? And almost always the answer was yes. Now, there was one time I brought Adam in where Alejandro and I were trying to do a cut when it was panning between uh, Amy Ryan and Michael Keaton at the table there when he's telling his story about George Clooney on the airplane. And and Adam says, we can do that one, but it's going to be the pretty much the whole effects budget. So it's going to, you know, he says, and, and then we voted not to do it. So, because it was, you know, the, you've got the mirrors and you've got the camera moving up and down and you've got, you know, we were trying to like wipe in the middle of the mirror when we were coming across and and we gave up on that one. So I have a question. When you yeah. say we called Adam and so on and so forth, I mean, your office can be in Paramount and well, their I, office I, is in Santa Monica. Well, I was, I was in, you know, when we were que shooting at Queen's Astoria stages, I was upstairs and they were shooting downstairs. So the visual effects guy was up and down the steps all the time. So that's and a good then thing. when we were in Manhattan, I was in the Brill Building on Broadway and... 50th Street, and they were shooting most of the movie on 43rd, 43rd Street. So we saw we saw each other quite a bit. I didn't. Uh, I got to know these people. So. Well, I mean, and you're saying you're on set. It's so rare and editors on set. Yeah. I mean, editors yeah. have to be. What was the term I once heard? The friendly executioner. Yeah. And if they are on set and they see how much a scene costs, how much went into it, they might be less likely to cut it. Yeah, that's it's what I always said too. You don't want to be influenced by what the pain they went through to get a shot to tell them that, you know, hey, you know, you don't need it, you know. Um, <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, as a director, I've come to realize how important editing is and that you can do magical things. You can rewrite the story in editing. And it seems to me like it can be a very political job. Like, you can have different interests, different people who want you to, you know, make the movie into a different thing. And I'm just wondering if um, you find that you know, directors have to earn the right to work with editors and like who has the power and who, and in, in your understanding of the profession, is it common for directors to, to have that power? Or do they have to earn it over time at the highest levels which you are at with directors you work with? Well, um, I, I think this is probably true for most editors and I hope it is. I, I, I definitely took this edict from Steven is when I'm working on a movie, I work for the director and I don't work for anybody else. Nobody else tells me what to do or what to change or how they want it. We'll have producers in the room 
when they when the producers allowed to come in and they'll give their notes and their notes they don't give me notes separately their notes go to the director and the director gives me the notes i i you know and they fight it out they fight out the politics and and if they're arguing about things i'll i'll sometimes i'll usually agree now when i say I work for my director i will agree with my director if i agree with him if i don't i will say i will take the producer's side if i agree with the producer on something but i won't i you know i um i try to stay out of that political nonsense that'll happen i would say as a director you should if you you get final cut as as quickly as you can in your career and you hold on to it and you never give it up okay. i mean harmony Harmony, when I was doing, shooting Spring Breakers, the producers came to him and said they wanted, they want to have Final Cut. And he says, you can give me $10 million right now, you're not getting it. So that's, that's his standpoint. And he's, he's had Final Cut from the day he started and he won't ever give it up. And Soderbergh has Final Edit. Or if you're going to hopefully align yourself with a producer that's strong and someone you trust immensely, they might have Final Cut over you on your first couple movies, but they'll have your back. And that's, you know... And I know, you know, now we're, we're talking about George Clooney. George Clooney's first movie, he didn't have Final Cut, but Soderbergh did. And Soderbergh was a producer on it. So and they're, they're as tight as they get, those two guys. So that's the way you start out before you get your final edit. That was my thought. That's, I'm sorry, that's, it came back to me. Okay. Okay, so since you said you work really close with the director, um, how do you make sure as an editor, uh, which, who also needs to re recreate it, the the, the movie, but you also make sure that you, like, you work really close with the director, so you get what the director wants, but also to input your own creative into the film. The way I work is, you know, I usually will tell a director front, you know, straight out, and they usually, you know, if you're hired like a normal or you're hired while they're shooting, my biggest influence initially is the assembly, because I'm assembling the movie and they have no input. So I cut the film together and by the time they show up I've got a cut of the movie. Now it's usually too long and it's usually boring and it's usually, you know, and it's it's got all kind of problems and story things don't make sense. And then I give the direct I kind of give the director his moment where I I don't say anything hardly. I'm like I'm like okay, we're going to work the next couple of weeks and I want to hear everything you want to do. You know, where I'll even tell a director what I love to do and I did this with harmony too is we won't watch the whole movie when they come in for the first time. They'll come in, this is what I prefer, and this is what I always try to talk them into. They'll come in and I'll say, let's watch 20 minutes. You tell me what you hate about this 20 minutes, what I got completely wrong, what, 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 was, what, what, what performance I put in that you absolutely hate, or this or that, or, or you, know, you want to try some music, and then let me work on that 20 minutes. And then tomorrow we'll watch the next 20 minutes or whatever, and then you will do the same thing. And then like a week or so, now we'll watch the whole movie. At least then they've put their stamp on it a little bit. And then, and, then, and then we will go through it again and I'll work on their cut. But then after we're in that stage, after you know, a few weeks where I've let them just tell me what they want, then it becomes, I try to get my perspective of saying, okay, now this is what I think, or this is what this is working, and then we'll watch the movie with other people. And, we'll, and then it becomes a back and forth, hopefully. But I always usually take my feed from the director as much as possible. So. Hard to say. But that's good because they only get the, the directs only get depressed for 20 minutes <laughs> instead yeah. of for the whole movie. You, directors will get suicidal when they watch a whole assembly sometimes. I think David Schwimmer was ready to jump out the window. Uh, he was, you know, he got, and I kept telling him, let's not watch the whole movie. <laughs> And he's like, oh, <laughs> I, he says, I screwed up. I think the 20 minutes is a great idea. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah. So in your opinion, uh, what, when do you think uh, Regan Thompson died? Like when he jumps and flies? Uh, oh. Like uh, the ending of the movie. Or in the end? Um, I'll tell I'll uh, this joke worked before. I'll tell you what, I, what Alejandro told me. He didn't tell me anything. I, I, I don't know how the movie ends. I, you know, I, maybe I'm an idiot, but I never questioned it. I never questioned what that ending meant or why it was or what happened. Um, I mean, it's up for your interpretation. I mean, there's some people who actually literally hate the end of the film. They feel like the movie was perfect up to, you know, they wanted, I probably wanted to end the movie where he shoots himself. But I don't know what, how, what the ending means. Did he shoot himself in the last part in the hospital as a dream? Did, did, and he's dead, or it's, or did, 
or did he jump out the window and he fly, or did he jump out the window and he splat on the pavement? But his daughter, see, I don't, one of the people they hate the ending because they feel like the movie switches its POV all of a sudden. It's gone from Reagan's POV to her POV. You know, at one point, all hundred wanted to put like the comet in the window reflection, or the and that's what she's looking at, or show her give the idea of what she's looking at up in the sky, and um, but. No, I don't know what it means. It's, 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 it's um, up to you. Also, you as an editor, uh, there are some editors who like standing up editing. Uh, so what do you like to do for I editing? still sit down. Maybe it's bad for me. I should probably stand. <laughs> I want to get one of those ones that go up and down. They, they have the ones that, you know, you can raise the table for part of the day and sit for part of the day. Um, I guess I could sit in one of these big chairs and then I could, uh, and then I could stand when I'm, you know, wanting to feel like I want some exercise. But I've, I've worked for an assistant who stands, but I haven't gotten into it. I, I, I like to get up a lot, though. I like to get up and, you know, go for a walk. For I get up every hour. I don't. I don't. I don't know, or, or even more oh, often yeah. than that. Good idea. I don't. I don't sit for long. Thank so. you. Is there a particular armrest you like to use? <laughs> I, I, you know, I tend to lean on one too much, and then usually my my I, I have holes in my elbows right here. That's why I develop. Hi. Yeah. Um, in the whole process of editing in this movie, were there like some core ideas that you had to keep reminding yourself of during the whole process, and that that you can refer to when you had to make some decisions? Well, I had the, I had the core idea is I had to remember that I wasn't allowed to have any edits. Um, <laughs> it, it's 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 funny though because you know Stephen and I both thought you know Alejandro's going to do this for about a week and give up and start shooting coverage. And, you know, and, and, and he let me know early on, he says, we are not doing this any differently. This is how it's going to be. And because, um, but I think maybe some of the things that were different is, is the constant feedback I had to give the director that I'm not used to doing during shooting. And one of the, mo one of the scenes that I gave feedback very early on, and this is where he actually looked at me weird, is he had shot the scene with the reporters and Michael Keaton in that, you know, where they're interviewing him, and he had shot it completely differently. He had shot it where the, it's, you're on Michael Keaton in the back of his head almost, and we're just seeing the reporters. And I said to him, well, I said, if I was cutting this, I would definitely want to cut around and see Michael's performance and how he's reacting to what they're saying to him. And he says, you think so? And I go, well, yeah. And, he says, and then he actually, because Stephen wasn't there, he called Stephen up. He said, does Doug know we're not editing this movie? And, 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 and I did. Of course, I did. But so to my surprise, like two days later, three days later, he shot the scene and, and, and staged it differently. And, and, and I will say, when they shot the Emma Stone scene where she's yelling at her dad, the impulse in me as the editor is to see Michael Keaton react. You know, I want to do that. I want... And, and I almost said it to him there, and I, I'm glad I didn't, because he was absolutely right. I, I, I didn't, he was absolutely right. Just stay on her, let her finish, let her react. And he was, that was how that should play. So, but what was your question? It was a question, it was, it was, <laughs> oh, it's it, was like, it was, it was, it was what, like some, what were the disciplines or something that? Yeah, like you refer to during the whole process when you had to make some decisions and you get confused. So you had to like refer back to it. Yeah. Yeah. See, I was doing the trick of not answering your question, but answering what I wanted the question, the question I wanted. No, I, I, uh, I think that it, it, it was a matter of just uh, of, of, of uh, just doing every trick you know that you can pull off. And, you know, I mean, on arbitrage, I think, I think in arbitrage we have something like 60 jump, invisible jump cuts. Where, and because arbitrage was, uh, was more of a lockdown camera, I did a lot of, and and we wanted to pay something up. We would, we w I would cut like you know, you know three seconds out of the shot and and morph the two images together and we'd hide the edit. And I think there's quite a few of those. So I would use some of those tricks I learned. I, I only got to do that once on Birdman because the camera's moving so much. But I actually had to do one with Ed Norton on the roof where he'd flubbed the line and and I and and he says it right two seconds later, but. You know, I, I needed to lose that space and lose that flubbed line, and I was able to cut it and morph the image. And uh, so that might answer the question. Magician tricks, yeah. yes. Go ahead. Hi, uh, uh, you said in the final uh, product that there were around 100 cuts, but how many were 
originally planned? I honestly don't remember exactly. I mean, I, it probably is like the number of 30 or 40 that that people uh, think they see in the movie um, because those are the more obvious ones. But even within those, I mean, he was, he would, he would, he always knew he had other outs. So like he would shoot, he shot the scene, but then he realized he wanted to reshoot part of the, and again, he says, well, this is, we can come in right here where we hadn't planned to put an edit, but we can come in here and put an edit and, and, and I can use this reshoot part. So, um, but yeah, it's something, I, I never got the stitch list. The stitch list was the famous list that says where these are where the edits are going to happen in the movie that were planned. So I, I, it was probably around that number. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask you, because for some of the people that are thinking of maybe going into that, when you were assistant editor on traffic on, you know, 21 gram, all that, what is the job of the assistant editor? Your job is to support your editor full heartedly, just like your job as an editor is to support the director full heartedly. You, you, you know, you have to make sure they get everything they need to do their job and not have to worry about all the particulars. You know, you got to make sure that the footage is coming in, that, that it's being done right. It's you sync it properly. If you have to sync it, you have to organize it the way they want it organized, and you have to make sure that they don't, they're not still going well look at this take here, it's all messed up, and you, you, you give this to me, and I can't cut with this, or, you know, you, you got to make sure you're hopefully supporting them, you know, it's not the days of where you stand and have them a film trim, so it's, it's, you know, it's organizing dailies, getting in them there, supporting them, I do a lot of extra cutting for my editor when I was editing, and I also do a lot of sound editing for him, um, I don't usually, I haven't found an assistant yet that can sound edit the way I did, so, it, but you know, I would cut sound effects constantly and cut, you know, and build backgrounds and do all kind of things just to, to give him so that he could just cut the movie. In fact, when me and Stevens first started working together, he did, he did it very much in the old style where he would cut and wouldn't fill his tracks. He'd leave the gap there and the empty sound open and I'd have to go through and fill it in later and I'd do audio adjustments and raise and lower the levels and I would mix it for him too. So, and I, but I haven't found an, an assistant I trust to do that to yet. I'm still waiting for somebody. Maybe right. it's because I did it so much myself all the time. And, I, and it totally affects, like, when you watch yeah. even a rough cut <clears throat> and the sound hasn't had some element of polish to it. Yeah. Like, it can take you right out of the edit to a point where it's almost yeah. hard to judge, is this thing working or not? Yeah, yeah. so it, it definitely, you, 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 do, you do have to polish it way more than you had to in the olden days, that's for sure. So, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. My question is in regards of, so we've been talking or you've been talking a lot about how there's rewrites in the editing room. And also you gave an example of Spring Breakers, which was almost completely rewritten and the post-production part of it. And Bourbon just seems like a super planned ahead film with all the cuts and where everything is going to fall and how the story is going to develop and what is really necessary and what is just totally not because they even like you said they rehearsed it for a lot of time so i wanted to know how much actually went into rewriting it at the editing room was there any leeway there or it was just okay this is what it is and this is what you got and there's can be cut more or less uh yeah there really wasn't room to re-edit the movie in the editing room i mean alejandro shot some alternates for things sometimes he shot outs for himself sometimes he you know this is how smart he is i mean he he knew, you know one that one he shot was which we didn't use was he had actually shot an alternate so that when after uh michael keaton trashes his room and and zach allen Knox comes in and goes back out then then naomi watts goes back in and she starts talking he actually shot it in a way that she wouldn't go in that she'd be out in the doorway and then she walks away and she doesn't go in. So he actually gave himself that alternate. Um, there will never be like scenes cut out of the film. Yeah, so yeah, so I could lose that scene if I wanted to because he had in the back of his mind, I might not need this. And there was a whole extra scene in the bar with the critic where I, yeah, when Michael Keaton goes over to talk to her, she summons someone who tends bar there to quote Shakespeare to show him how bad of an actor he is. So he, um, and you know, and how much better this person is. So 
that was an extra bit that was written and shot, but we also shot it without it. And we were able to do a cut sometimes for certain things, and there was a definite moment that was cut from the film because it felt like a repeated beat. And it, was, it worked out perfectly for us because, you know, when they go into the, when they go into the cell phone and it comes out in the bar, it originally didn't do that. It went into the cell phone, and, but didn't go in the whole way. And just, it wasn't supposed to go into the cell phone. It was supposed to just see the cell phone. And then the scene went on a little bit longer. And then he goes and washes the coloring out of his beard. And then he gets another call. And then that's when we went into the phone. And, and then it came out in the bar. But we went in, we just decided we didn't need the rest of that scene and we didn't need that extra beat. So we just went into the phone there and got out into the bar. So, and that was probably the biggest cut we made <laughs> that, that wasn't, uh, you know, because I said so much was pre planned. And like the rooftop scene with Ed Norton and Ed Emma Stone, I think there's probably six or seven different versions of that one scene with different lines of dialogue and lines eliminated. And we went with the version with the most lines taken out. Because ultimately we decided there was an extra whole story where Ed Norton talks about his father. And we just decided, you know, but he shot that version, but we didn't use that version. So yeah. I had a second part of the question. I don't, yeah. I don't know if you mind. Um, so the, the, for the whole film, is it's seemingly a one shot, right? But then he shots himself in the theater. And then we get this montage where we finally see cuts. The, the only cut that we see um, before that was at the very beginning the from the, I don't know, it's a comment or something, yeah. right? Um, but then from there, we we go back into cutting. It's kind of like a montage. There's probably some 10 cuts. And then we go back into the um, those one shot. shot um, was that something that was planned from the script? Or was that something that you guys came up with it uh, to give some meaning to the ending later in the post? He he had that idea while he was shooting. He, I, I, it's not that montage isn't in the script. Um, I don't think I don't think so. I don't think it is. Maybe I'm wrong. It's been I, I haven't read the script since I read it before I started on the movie. So, um, but I don't think that montage was in the script. And and I was always told there's only one shot. There's not gonna be cuts. There's not gonna be cuts. And then I'm getting dailies and I'm seeing this marching band on the stage. And in slow motion, and he's shooting this stuff, and I'm like, "What is this for?" <laughs> and you know, and I had no idea, and he, you know, he had to tell me. He says, "This is I'm going to have cuts," and I'm like, "But you've been saying we're not going to have cuts." And it was you know, so great. It was yeah. like the perfect moment. Yeah, to have cuts. I thought he was just genius. Yeah, yeah. so he, yeah, yeah, he told me, "I want cuts. I want to see. I want to take us out of this and have this moment of of these. It's like yeah. you know, basically a dream." So right, it almost felt like, I, "Okay, we've been doing this one shot because that's how life feels like, mm -hmm. right?" But there's a moment where you just like it's it's shot in the head, and then right. your moment, your life just gets kind of like chopped up. It's a good inter interpretation because Alejandro did say that you know when we wake up in the morning, we're not. We're not. Uh, we don't edit because we, you know, we don't. We 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 see. Of course, you listen to the Walter Merch every time you blink. You're editing, but um, it's uh, yeah. But we have that continuous shot idea, and that's yeah. And then that that when you would probably shoot yourself, things aren't so coherent. Who knows? So. Great. Thank knows? you so much. Yeah. One last question, yeah. because you see the uh, the critic leave. Everybody stands up, right? Gives an yeah. ovation. You see her leave, right? And then there is this great review, but it cannot be her paper, the New York Times, because they don't really put that kind of uh, uh, title. Right. Well, they called it the um, they called it the Times. They never actually said the New York Times. It's, a, it's set in the near future where yeah, the Times has taken yeah, over New York. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> but the implication is that she did give him that. Yeah, that she gave him a good review, yeah. She's, she's you see, be. you can change anybody's mind. That's, That's the, the idea, idea yeah, yeah, I guess. All you have to do is give a good performance. I yeah. love when Ed Norton says, yeah, you can write a bad review once I give yeah, you a bad, bad performance. Yeah. I thought it was so brilliant. Well, I, I can't think of, like, it, I'm trying to think in recent history, a movie that I think our students, myself, Topa, would be as excited to talk with the editor about. Yeah. I know. You know, I'm like thinking in my head, I'm like, well, Traffic, but you worked on Traffic, and uh, Babel, well, you worked on that, you yeah. edited that. So, I mean, I think there, there's something to be said where 
so much of us here, it's, it really is like hearing a great magician, you know, not telling us, to, you didn't tell us everything, yeah. and for the record, he did not tell us everything, I nothing, promise. Nothing, yeah. nothing. Nothing, nothing. But, nothing. But, but just the fact that you sort of talked about this process and, you know, what went into this, I mean, I think it was so exciting, I know, for myself to, like, hear about some of, maybe not the secrets, but at least something resembling a secret that went into this, and that really how much work you guys put into this movie, you know, as editors, you and uh, Stephen Marioni. I mean, it really was remarkable to see, you know, the product that you guys were able to put together from a lot of really, in some ways, crazy ideas that Lots really of worked together. Lots, Lots of, of corridors, corridors going up and down. And they actually, I think, I didn't know this, they actually adjusted those corridors wider and narrower for different parts of the movie, so they're not... They're not, uh, it's supposed to be a subtle thing as his world's close, closing in on him. Right. And, and also the performances, which, um, I mean, I know we're wrapping here, but, yeah. I mean, three acting nominations from this film. Right. I mean, that's rare. Like, very few movies ever get that many nominations nowadays from... Yeah. Uh, I knew it would because, of, you know, because of the long takes and the looks, and I, you know, I knew Michael, I, I predicted he was going to win the Oscar when I was shooting this movie. So I was wrong, but... You get nominated, but should have. <laughs> How many people here feel that they got something out of this conversation?